Advaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Visakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavanishwade Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpata Rubyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Vyeva Cha Patita Nam Pavani Bhyo Vaishna Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adoita Kedarhar Shri Vasudhi Gora Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Five. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if anyone has a Gita, but chapter six, Dhyana Yoga, text number five. Who the red Atmanatmanam Natmanam Avasadayat. Atmaiva hi atmano bandur. Atmaiva ripur atmanaha. Udared atmanatmanam. Natmanam avasadayet. Atmaiva hi atmano bandur. Atmaivari Pur Atmanaha Udaret One must deliver Atmana by the mind Atmanam the conditioned soul Na never Atmanam the conditioned soul Avasadayet Put into degradation, atma, mind, eva, certainly, he, indeed, atmanaha, of the conditioned soul, bandur, friend, atma, mind, eva, certainly, ripu, enemy. Atmanaha, of the conditioned soul. Translation, one must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Purport, the word atma denotes body, mind, and soul, depending upon different circumstances. In the yoga system, there's actually another place where it says Atma has seven different meanings, but these are at least three of the different meanings, body, mind, and soul. So depending upon different circumstances. In the yoga system, the mind and the conditioned soul are especially important. Since the mind is the central point of yoga practice, Atma refers here to the mind. The purpose of the yoga system is to control the mind and to draw it away from attachment to sense objects. So the purpose of the yoga system, draw the mind away from the attraction to sense objects, controlling the mind. Generally, nowadays, most yoga is just to have a good, healthy, strong body, and it's, it definitely is good for that reason. It definitely helps. But to try to, to actually perfect your life through Astanga Yoga is extremely difficult. Arjun even rejected this. He said it's easier, he finds it easier to control the raging wind than to control his restless mind. So at the end of this chapter, Krishna says, uh, 
yoginam api savesham madgatenantaratmana shvadavan bhajate yomam samayutaktamo mataha. Out of all yogis, he who always abides in me with great faith, worshipping me in transcendental loving service, is most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. So he describes the bhakta, the bhakta or bhakti yogi is the highest of all the different yogis. There are different types of yoga, and Prabhupada explains that it's like a ladder, the different rings or steps on the ladder, but the highest one is bhakti. The others help you to come to bhakti. So what is bhakti? Bhakti simply means love and devotion to God. Love and devotion. So people may have some love and devotion, but pure, uncontaminated love and devotion, not caring for oneself, not caring, f f when I say oneself, not caring for one's body, not caring for the attachments or even the expansions of the body as much as caring for, for God, more than anything. If the great devotees think that if my unhappiness gives you happiness, then that unhappiness is my greatest pleasure. Being unhappy is giving me pleasure then, because I see it makes you happy. So that's love. In the material world, love is conditional. I love you if you love me. I'll love you if you do this. We make some agreement. Even in a marriage, it says for better or for worse. But then when it gets worse, so let's just forget this here. <laughs> it ain't working out. That's <laughs> You know, in the material world, there's going to be so many difficulties in life. And one who has a relationship with God, sometimes there's going to be a lot of difficulties. And you have to do, you know, try to please God or Krishna, no matter what other, other difficulties you may be having. Just like sometimes you may try to surrender to Krishna and people will go against you. So then you start to think, well, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. But those pure devotees, they have no doubts. They know they're doing it. Bhakti Siddhanta, he you know, was so positive about everything. Although there was one time that I know when he had a sannyasi fall down. And he was, he, he said, I, he said, I quit. <laughs> of course, he didn't quit. But he said, I quit. I, he said, why did you inspire me to give him sannyas if you knew that he wasn't going to keep his vows? So he's, his connection with Krishna is so that he knows Krishna is inspiring him to do this. So he, he does it. And now look at the results. Of course, after you know, just a short while, he just came back like every like normal, like nothing was wrong. But he was, he got a little bit upset with Krishna. Why did you do this? So with Lord Chaitanya, whoever it is, he felt that inspired him to give this person sannyas. But then maybe he got some realizations of why this is the material world. In the material world, there's going to be so many problems. Just like we're reading today about Bhakti Siddhanta, there was a man telling Bhakti Siddhanta about this great devotee, such a great devotee. He serves Lord Chaitanya like anything. He's always chanting, and his daughter got very sick, and he chanted even more, and he chanted more, and he was so devoted. And then his daughter died, and he said that Lord Chaitanya is no sense worshiping Lord Chaitanya. So Bhakti Siddhanta said that I am following the footsteps of Srivas, whose son died, and he complained to, to, the, to his wife and the others, why are you making a fuss? You're interfering with the kirtan of Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> now, you might think that's cold, but if you understand who you are, you know, it's like praying to God, God, please, please, don't let my dress get ripped. Please don't. Who cares about your dress? That's not you. So those who are self-realized understand this body is not you. The body of my son is not my son. He's the soul within that body. 
You know, so we put so much emphasis on the dress. And it's, there's a, a play that, that was done once, at least once. This person is, he says, help, help. He just died in the middle of the floor. Help, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And then, uh, and then his wife says, help, my, my husband is drowning. And then somebody comes, I'm a social worker, I'll save him. I save people, I help people. So he jumps in, make, pretends, swims, he comes back with his coat. And she says, you, you, don't, you didn't save him, all you saved was his coat. And then the purport is that this body is just like a dress. We put it on at birth, we take it off at death, but while we're in it, we think this is, this is us. This is our illusion. We're not these bodies. Like someone asked Srila Prabhupada about, he said, I'm so selfish. Prabhupada said, it's okay to be selfish if you know who your real self is. So if you're selfish, you're doing what's best for you, the soul, then that's fine. But if you're doing what's best for this body, that's no good. I mean, you could do what's good for the body. You take care of the body. We even recommend, you know, do some yoga, do some exercise, do something. Take care of your body. Because it's an instrument for the soul. But you don't get so attached to the body. It's like you got clothes. You wash your clothes. You clean them. You might iron them if you're that ambitious. <laughs> But, but that's not, you don't put, you know, if you rip it, it's not the end of the world, you know. It's just, a, just some dress you're wearing, some shirt or pants or something else. It's not, it's not you, you know. So we get so attached to these bodies, and this is an illusion. And we're all in this illusion to different degrees. So here, the mind is also the body. I was sitting, no, standing, behind Srila Prabhupada in Atlanta, Georgia when he was giving class. I was standing behind him because I know if I sat, I'd probably fall asleep, sleeping you know, maybe four hours a night and working all day like anything, physically, going out selling books. So you get really tired. So I was standing up and uh, Prabhupada, there was a question someone asked. If you die and your, your body is engaged in serving Krishna, do you go back to Godhead? I thought it was a good question. And Prabhupada started answering. And the, initially, of course, you know, your mind, you can't help your mind from thinking things. But initially, I was thinking Prabhupada didn't understand the question <laughs> because he started answering, Earth, water, fire, air, eat, the mind, intelligence, and false ego. These, these eight uh, are my separated material energies. And I'm thinking, what has this got to do? Just a simple. Anyway, then he started describing. Then I started following. And he answered in such a way that a lot of people, if you weren't listening attentively, you may not get the real answer he was giving. But his answer was he first described so much about your body. You have earth, water, fire, air, ether. We have this gross body. We also have mind, intelligence, and false ego. We have both of these bodies. We have two bodies. We have a subtle body and a gross body. This is our gross body. I'm, I'm making it a little clearer. Prabhupada, did, not that he didn't make it clear, but he said it in... I thought he said it in such a way not to discourage anyone. But first he went into explaining so much about the two bodies that you have. And then at the end he said, so if, you're in, if your body is serving Krishna at the time of death, you will go back to Krishna. But it wasn't just your gross body. It was also your subtle body. <laughs> but it was really nice. So here the mind, talking about the mind. Uh, the purpose of the yoga system is to control the mind and to draw it away from attachment to sense objects. It is stressed herein that the mind must be so trained that it can deliver the conditioned soul from the mirror of nescience. So we have to train our mind. A mind is like a computer. You know, we have to reprogram it. We program now, we program our mind that whatever is favorable for this body, then that I should accept. And whatever is not, then I reject. But now we have to 
change it to whatever is favorable for Krishna, whatever is pleasing to Krishna, that I accept, and whatever is not pleasing to Krishna, that I reject. So the mind can be our friend or our enemy, depending on how we have programmed it or how conditioned it is. In material existence, one is subjected to the influence of the mind and the senses. In fact, the pure soul is entangled in the material world because of the mind because the mind is involved with the false ego, which desires to lord it over material nature. Therefore, the mind should be trained so that it will not be attracted by the glitter of material nature. And in this way, the conditioned soul may be saved. So we have to control our mind not to get into this illusion of trying to enjoy this material nature, but to understand that I am a soul. I have to accept what's good for me. And what's good for me is what's good for Krishna. So one should not degrade oneself by attraction to sense objects. The more one is attracted by sense objects, the more one becomes entangled in material existence. The best way to disentangle oneself is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. Always engage the mind. In, so the, the yoga practice, to just sit and just control the mind, doing nothing, is really hard. But if you engage your mind in a positive alternative, actually doing something for Krishna, you can sweep the floor for Krishna, you can chant for Krishna, you can actually engage in different types of service to please Krishna. So you're engaging your senses you're not just trying to stop your senses, withdraw your senses. You're engaging them in a higher activity. But basically, we're engaging our senses instead of just withdrawing them. You could try withdrawing them, and they're going to go right back out onto something else as soon as you look. <laughs> but if you're engaging them, if you're engaging your senses, then your senses are controlled. So you engage them in a higher activity of service to God then it's easy to control your senses. Well, certainly a lot easier. And then you have to stay engaged all the time. And not just, just the physical body, your physical senses, but your mind should be absorbed also in this service. This is devotional service. The best way to disentangle oneself is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. The word he is used this is H-I, it's a Sanskrit word, is used for emphasizing this point. Example, that one must do this. It is also said, mama eva manusyanam karanam banda mokshayo bandaya vishaya sargo muktyai nirvi shayam manaha. For man, mind is the cause of bondage and mind is the cause of liberation. Mind absorbed in sense objects is the cause of bondage, and mind detached from sense objects is the cause of liberation. Amrita Bindu Upanishad 2. So, mind detached from sense objects. The best way to detach your mind from sense objects is to attach your mind to Krishna. Therefore, the mind which is always engaged in Krishna consciousness is the cause of supreme liberation. So we have a mind, we have so many things, and everything is meant to be utilized in Krishna's service. Krishna, is the, he's the proprietor of everything. So everything belongs to him. So if we utilize everything for him, we're giving it back to who it belongs. And that way we are actually benefiting from it. We get rewarded. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about just like a... a um, a servant of the king lives almost as good as the king. So if you're serving God, you live almost as good. He takes care of you. You have to have some faith. And faith comes by, by trying it. You have to have a little faith at start, but your faith increases. Because once you have a little faith, Krishna shows you this is the right path. This is the right thing. You're doing good. Keep it up. <laughs> A little pat on the back. <laughs> you get realization. It says, uh, you know, Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitram 
that this knowledge is the it's the king of knowledge. Uh, it's a perfection of religion. Uh, it's, it's everlasting and it's joyfully performed. But it says one, what does it say? Something in realization in that reverse. I know. Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitram Itam Utamam Pratyaksha Vagamam Damyam Susukam Kartamaviyam. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets, the purest knowledge. What? Direct perception of the self by realization. Thank you. You can go back now. <laughs> Direct perception of the self by realization. So you get realization, and you can understand who you really are, that I'm not this body. I mean, devotees get realizations, and then somehow or other, illusory energy covers them up again, and they start to think they're the body, and they want to enjoy their senses. So you got to keep practicing. No, I don't want this. The pure devotees never think that. Pure devotees are always absorbed in serving Krishna. That's all they do. And they ha are convinced, without a doubt, that they're doing the right thing. And they know. And no matter how many people go against them, it doesn't make one bit of difference. They're not interested in popular votes. They're interested in pleasing the Acharyas. Prabhupada said that. We're not interested in popular opinion. We're interested in pleasing the Acharyas. So people don't like us too bad. We don't care. We go on. You know, we go out chanting. People, some people might complain, you know, make fun at us or something. That's fine. Who cares? Doesn't. Prabhupada gave an example of a. Sometimes wedding processions. They have elephants, big elephants, go through these villages. Then uh, there's dogs. Sometimes dogs will be barking because these big elephants are there. The elephants could care less what the dogs think, and they just keep walking. They're not disturbed by the dogs. Although I had a practical experience that seemed to differ a little bit from that. <laughs> in Mayapur, they have, a, they, had, they have two elephants now, but they only had one then. And I used to go see the elephant every morning. I used to feed him, feed her. And uh, one day I went there, and I'd give her, give her these big banana leaves. She had, a, she had a, a ritual this elephant would do. I don't know if all elephants do this, but this one... You take the big banana leaves, put, hit its back, hit this side, hit this side, put it down, step on it one foot, and with its trunk, rip all the leaves off of it and eat it. Every single time I gave it to a, a big banana leaf, it did this. So one time I was there, and this dog is barking, and the elephant just takes the thing, and he goes to hit the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and the dog ran away. I didn't notice. The, I didn't even know the elephant noticed the dog. It was like so peaceful and just took it in its went. <laughs> it didn't hit the dog, but it went at the dog, and the dog ran. <laughs> so, sometimes they get they don't like dogs. <laughs> anyway, I'll read the translation one more time. One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. So the mind that's controlled is his friend. And the mind that's not controlled and controlling the, the senses, that is his enemy. I mean, controlling the senses to do, or no, following the senses. In other words, we have, to use control, we have to use our intelligence, control our mind, and control our senses. Not have our senses go wherever they want without any control. So the mind that doesn't, you know, lets the senses do whatever it wants, that mind is the enemy of the conditioned soul. And the mind that, control, no, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't, I shouldn't eat this. This is not offered. I'm not going to eat it. Or I can't offer this. Or this depends on how strict you are. You know, this has caffeine. I don't want it. Anybody that strict? <laughs> I know a few people are. Which is good. I mean, I generally, like I was just at a place and they were giving me some soda that had caffeine. I said, no. Not that it's, it's not like a terrible thing. But, you know, why? Why take this, this, in, this, it's a drug, it has an effect, 
And it doesn't help your Krishna consciousness, so why bother with it? Anyway, I'm not trying to preach against caffeine, but... <laughs> But that, I'm trying to find something that you might, some people might consider okay, some people might not. But, you know, so you can be stricter. The stricter you are, the better. But you shouldn't be fanatical. Like, I don't eat ca caffeine, so anybody's eating caffeine, oh, you're in Maya. <laughs> we shouldn't be fanatical like that. So, we only got a, we got a few minutes left. Any questions? Yes. Well, the best way is by doing devotional service. Your mind can be controlled by thinking of Krishna's pastimes, uh, your service. If you're using your mind to figure out how to do your service, that's controlling your mind. And uh, instructions. We used to say a, a sip. Take a sip of Krishna. You know, service, instructions, and pastimes. <laughs> so if you're engaging your mind in these things, that's controlling your mind. Yes? What if you're not in a temple or a place where you can do devotional services? Say so you're someone that's relatively new and you want to control your mind without repressing it. Right. Without oppressing it. Right. Okay, but you, you don't have to live in a temple to do devotional service. You can do devotional service at home. Depends on how new you are. You know, you can have a little altar. You can make an offering. You can cook. Try to cook nicely. Only the things, you know, no meat, fish, or eggs. No onions or garlic. Things you can offer to Krishna. You cook it nicely. And you don't taste anything. Prabhupada said sometimes if you want, you can taste by smelling. You can smell it to see if it smells right so that you can offer it to Krishna so it's nice. And then you offer it. So that whole time you're absorbed in that, that's controlling your mind because your ultimate goal is to offer it to Krishna. You can chant Hare Krishna. You're chanting Hare Krishna, but not just chanting, try to hear the chanting. Lots of times we're chanting and our mind is all over the place. We have to try to bring it back to the hearing. I mean, for most people, that's the beginning, is the hearing and chanting. But then you learn more, and there's more things you can do, even at home. Chanting? Well, to control the mind. <laughs> but Krishna is not different from his name. Krishna is not different from anything in relationship with him because he's absolute. In the absolute world, all there is is Krishna. There is part and parcels of Krishna. But everything is not different. Everything is ultimately Krishna. So similarly, Krishna's name is Krishna. It's not just a sound vibration. Like Shakespeare said, uh, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Because the rose and the name rose are two different things. But Krishna and the name Krishna are the same. There is no difference. So when you're chanting, you're actually associating personally with God. And by associating with him, he is supremely pure. You get purified by that association. And he's so pure, even though he purifies you, he doesn't get contaminated. Like the sun can purify a dirty place, and the sun doesn't get contaminated. So the holy name is not different from Krishna, so we chant it. It's pleasing to Krishna. Just like if, uh, you know, some, somebody is chanting his girlfriend's name, you know, all the time, you know, she's feeling pretty good. <laughs> so Krishna is pleased when we chant his names. And it's purifying, and it helps us to control the mind. It's all, it's, it's completely beneficial in every way. And you can do it even while you're doing things. I mean, we do try to chant so many rounds, just concentrating on chanting, not doing anything. But even while doing things, you can chant. And it's still benef beneficial. Any other questions? 
does that give you a chant when you're trying to chant the names of God? There are a lot of names. <laughs> Oh, there's called a Maha Mantra. <laughs> Maha means great. And mantra means mind deliverance, actually delivering our mind. The Maha Mantra is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So that's the best mantra. It's Hare is the energy of the Lord, and Krishna is the name of God, and Rama is another name of God. He has unlimited names. So there's so many. He's unlimited and he has unlimited names. And any name of God is purifying, although Krishna is the most potent. I think uh, three Ramas, three Ramas I think equal one Krishna. But we don't want to change it to Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. <laughs> we don't make these adjustments. <laughs> We just go nice and slow. <laughs> we'll get back to God. By not, I think it's time to end class. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. <laughs>